He is the social assassin. New York Times best-selling author because they don't track the worst-selling ones. John Gilstrap. Johnny, good morning. That's a very brief good morning after that bill. Good morning, Rob. How's that? <laughs> a little bit better. Okay. Yeah, you're getting there. You're warming up to the task, I think. Uh, let's see here. Oh, uh, also, if this is the first uh, part of the show you're tuning in on, uh, we have, uh, I don't know if Colin's going to put that back up again or not, but uh, the uh, QR code for the NCAA tournament, which in earnest gets going today. We've had the play-in games that are all done, so we're down to the field of 64. You uh, work on that QR code right there. It takes you to our uh, link for the NCAA tournament bracket. You can fill it out if you want to fill out another one. Up for grabs uh, for those in the top four at the end, Mother Shucker's gift certificates, and a trophy if you finish number one uh, overall. And you might as well start off by watching my Duquesne Dukes, who are in the NCAA tournament for the first time since 1977 when their point guard was Norm Nixon, who later went on to win an NBA championship or two with the Los Angeles Lakers. And uh, I was not at Duquesne at that point. I think I was in eighth grade, so no. How not. likely are they to go all the way? Not likely at all. Okay. But their coach, uh, Coach Dambrot, was LeBron James's high school coach. So uh, LeBron has kind of adopted the team a little bit, and it's made for a pretty good little uh, bit of public relations there. Right. Which is pretty cool. And then the coach, Dambrot, he is retiring at the end of this season. So whenever it's over, it's over. Uh, for him. He's won over 400 games in his career, not all those at Duquesne. He's coached a couple of different places. So, pretty cool. Our guest in this segment is Pasha Majdi from the Jefferson County Commission. Pasha, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I am great. How are you, man? I'm mediocre today. Oh, we'll okay. just, we're going to see if we can build that up. Bro, come on. <laughs> Something you want to talk about? <laughs> Lay down. It's got nothing to do with you. It's tonight. we got to pass the budget tonight, and it's going to be uh, rather unpleasant. Yeah, let's let's talk about that, Pasha. First and foremost, you've been on the commission for exactly how long now? Uh, about four months. About four months. Has this been an eye-opening experience for you, so to speak? It has. It has. The the county government is a mess, and that has been highlighted uh, through the budgeting process. We knew that going in because our budget was uh, a mess last year. We didn't know how bad it was going to be. Uh, it turned out worse than I had expected. Why? Why is it a mess, and what's led up to this? Well, we're missing $5 million, and we can't explain it. Uh, and that's not chump change. Uh, the budget the commission passed last year rated our rainy day fund with no notice or explanation to voters and left us with a major deficit for this year. And as a result, we can't fund ambulance service for communities that are in need, like uh, you know my friends and neighbors up on the mountain. We have zero dollars in our financial stabilization fund. What happened to it? Where did it go? I don't know. I wasn't on the commission last year, and um, I think this is uh, uh, not very impressive work. But we're doing what we can now to try and fix some of those problems. But this year's budget is—it's uh, not—it's not something to uh, throw a parade over. We had to cut fireworks this year. I mean, we haven't passed it yet. We'll pass it tonight. Uh, our deadline is tonight. Uh, that I can guarantee we're going to actually follow state law and pass it on time tonight. But you know, we have to do things like cut fireworks in our draft budget right now. We don't have a cost of living adjustment, uh, adjustment for employees, which is uh, extremely unpleasant for our hardworking employees who are experiencing, just like everybody else around Jefferson County, inflation. We don't have a COLA cost of living adjustment for them. Um, it, it's 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 not something to be uh, proud of, but I do want to, as a commission, but I do want to say our staff who we've brought on to fix this mess, because they're new, they were not on board last year, are doing a heroic job trying to catch all these errors, fix all these problems, and help us get to at least a balanced budget that's submitted legally on time in compliance with state law. Uh, and, and they should have their heads... Uh, held high because they're they're doing it while under staff. Pasha, we had Steve Pearson on yesterday from the Independent Observer, and he pointed out the fact that the county hasn't had a county administrator or a, a financial person in place for a while. And he said part of the reason was because they just didn't make an attempt to get one. And another part of that reason was is just because it's been a, a difficult place to work as of late. Do you agree with that? Is, has that been the situation? We have lost five finance directors in two years. And if you think that's random, uh, you are mistaken. 
Um, here are a couple of extreme examples. We had a finance director quit in the middle of budget season. That's a red flag. Here's a ridiculous example. We had a finance director quit on day three. They showed up. They clocked in. Day two goes by. Something smells wrong. By day three, they said, I'm out. I don't want to deal with this anymore. And the reason for that is we have a commissioner who's attacking staff via social media. If you look at the news story from April 2023, this is before I got on the commission. But if you read the article, the former commissioner asked, she said on the record that Commissioner Jackson was working with her campaign manager during meetings. Uh, this is the blogger who's running a social uh, media campaign against our staff. And uh, th disparaging uh, our staff, and it's created an environment where people don't want to work for Jefferson County. And I think that's evident by the fact that we've had five in two years, that we've had difficulty hiring people for this position because they don't want to walk into a hornet's nest. And uh, the, the ridiculous examples of people quitting within three days. I mean, if that doesn't set off alarm bells, I don't know what would. John Gilstrap. I'm actually trying to format a question out of here. I mean, it's um, the, what is the discussion among the commissioners? I mean, the, the symptoms are obvious and, you know, it, there ha uh, there's always a reason right and and every somebody's got to be held accountable uh, among who's there what's what's the next step i mean how, how do you fix it what are the here's the path to stability we have to pass a budget that's balanced that fits our and and complies with state law on time that's something we're required to do tonight and we will do that tonight the next step is we have to hire a full-time county administrator. We have somebody in the interim, Ms. Benitez, who has done admirable work under difficult conditions on an interim basis. But then we have to fire a full-time person. The reason we had an interim is because we knew this was going to be a mess, and we needed somebody immediately to get us through budget season. Once we get through budget season, which is now wrapping up, we hire a full-time county administrator. That person leads the charge to hire a finance director and balance the budget for next year. But... <laughs> We're, we're not starting in a good position. When you, when you start your budget deliberations and the staff says, oh, by the way, uh, we're not quite sure how, but we're about $4.8 million short, um, that's not a good way to start things. And we'll get it balanced. Now, the good news is we will have a balanced budget this year. We have not raised taxes or fees. We will be in compliance with state law. And we have removed gambling revenue from our operating budget, table revenue. Now, that, to me, that's a really big deal. Uh, you don't want to have table revenue in your operating budget because it's too volatile. It goes up, it goes down, and that's too much risk. And in my view, conservative budgeting requires that you move that to capital outlays, and that's what we've done. Uh, we are planning to vote on that tonight. I hope that uh, stays as uh, drafted because that's a top priority for me. My top priorities were don't raise taxes, remove gambling revenue from our operating budget, those two, we can check the box, but uh, fully fund our ambulance service was our next. That was my next priority, and we're going to fall way short on that. So let's let's peel that one back a little bit. Are you saying that we're going to be denying ambulance services at, at the end of this budget cycle? No. The way emergency services work are you will always get emergency services to which you're uh, entitled, uh, but... Um, we can improve the so-called level of service. So I would like to improve the level of service per the recommendations from our uh, 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 Department Director for Emergency Services, Mr. Sign. There are three areas that could improve level of service, and I would like to do that. That's our top. That's my top priority, and we will not be able to do that this year. We're going to have to uh, do it more slowly than I would like. When you say level of... I'm, I'm sorry, when you say level of service, does that mean basic life support versus advanced life support? No, it means response time. Okay. So the things will come quicker. And as you can imagine, that's very important. That's why it's my, it's my top priority. No one's, uh, thank you for asking that question. Let me dispel the rumor that people are not going to get ambulance service. That's not the case. But we could improve the quality. It could be quicker. We could route ambulances faster. They could get somewhere more quickly. And that. These are, you know, these are life and death situations, so it matters. 
Roger Mods, our guest here on the program from the Jefferson County Commission. They're voting on their budget tonight. It's been, as Pasha has been describing here, a bit of an adventure uh, over the last uh, two years. Uh, Pasha, we had, as I said, Steve Pearson on yesterday, and he described sitting in these meetings, listening to money uh, being discussed, and actually saying himself that he, looking at line items, discovered money that was not being recorded and included in the budget that was helping to reduce deficits and even then create a surplus. Is, is that true, that a, a writer was actually, uh, a publisher of a paper, was actually able to find funds that the commissioners didn't know about? Yeah, it was a bizarre moment because what we were trying to do was balance the budget and correct the errors from last year. And there are so many errors from last year because we didn't have a finance director at the time. We still don't have a finance director for the reasons uh, we discussed earlier. Um, as we were doing that, we weren't accounting for uh, transfers from other accounts, uh, et cetera. And one of the things that's involved with budgeting is forecasting what the transfers should be. Um, I'm, I'm not a budgeting professional. I'm not a finance director. I, there's an art to it that uh, is uh, above my pay grade. But my understanding was there were some forecasts for transfers in past budget years when we didn't have a finance director that uh, were too uh, – they were not conservative enough. They, they, they were a little bit too risky, so we had to uh, account for that. And in accounting for that, there were some surprises in this budget cycle. It is true. If you watch the video, it's, it's kind of bizarre. Mr. Pearson thankfully comes up to the microphone and says, you know, I, have, you, have you looked at this line item and then – Suddenly, we all look around and say, can we spend that? And the answer was yes. So that, that relieved a lot of the tension this year. I think the message that I have is this definitely shows why we need a finance director for Jefferson County. If, you know, I, I'm a Republican. I hear from Republicans all the time. You need to balance the budget, don't raise my taxes, and don't waste money. If you're missing $4.8 million out of a $34 million budget, that is not sound budgeting. That's not taking care of taxpayer dollars. And I think the top priority for the Republican Party should be fiscal conservatism and making sure our books are balanced. Because taxpayer dollars, people care about that here as they should, and as do I. Is J.B. McCuskey responsible for any of this in that it's the auditor's office to make sure that the municipalities and counties are submitting True budgets, honest budgets, and they have a good accounting of their funds? Is that not under the umbrella right. the of the auditor? The office has actually been quite helpful to us as we've been trying to uh, correct some errors from last year. Um, I, I can't explain it as well as our uh, county administrator could, but I'll do my best. It has to do with logging things into uh, the, the system, the financial tracking system, and when you don't have somebody who's monitoring that and watching that, and it just happens haphazardly throughout the year as the budget is revised, when you come to the end of the year and you're trying to balance the books, uh, you find some surprises. Uh, that's that's a layman's explanation. That's unfortunately the best I can do. But um, uh, Administrator Benitez could probably expand, explain it better than I could. And, and I don't know that I worded that correctly. I didn't mean to, to imply that JB was responsible for mishandling funds. I meant that there's, his office is responsible for auditing the counties and municipalities is uh, what I was actually intending to say uh, in regards to that. So uh, tonight, Pasha, will all the numbers be in the categories they were supposed to be in? And will all the funds that are supposed to have been included in this budget be accounted for, discovered, and slotted properly? For now, uh, I don't know if we're going to get a notice in a couple months, oh, we didn't see this or we didn't find that. In fact, um, I would expect that to happen. So I guess I guess I would say we're going to pass the balanced budget tonight, and we're going to continue to investigate the errors of FY24, fiscal year 24. That's uh, the last budget cycle we're voting on, fiscal year 25. We're going to continue to investigate what went wrong in fiscal year 24, and as those errors are uncovered, we'll have to correct them in real time. Is this a full-scale audit? Are you requesting an audit, or is this simply going through each piece of paper that the different people involved in categorizing money over the last year have left it? We are required by law to be audited, so that happens um, um, regularly. But uh, clearly something was left to be desired last year. 
So is the, the denial of quorum that dominated the news all through the autumn, is that a symptom of the dysfunction or is that a cause of the current problems or among the causes of the current problems? Well, I don't really know what happened there. Um, I wasn't on the commission uh, because, uh, you know, I was being considered to fill the vacancy. Um, I can tell you in the trial that uh, commissioners Jackson and Krause have decided to plead the fifth. And they've, so we don't know. But while they were pleading the fifth, they were lecturing everyone else on transparency. So that's an odd juxtaposition, if you ask me. Indeed. It's not exactly transparent to plead the fifth in court. But it is your right. We ought to have that right. I'm glad it's in the Constitution. But uh, we, can do, we can do away with the lectures on transparency while pleading the fifth. That's a compromised position. How about that? Fair enough. Fair enough, sir. So uh, will, this has to be finished tonight, Pasha, correct? Yes. What time is the meeting? We are starting at 6. I'll be there at 6. Uh, it might actually be 6.30. I should know that. Sorry. But uh, Jefferson County, WV.org. Is it streamed live? Yes. All right. Very good. Good, John. So assuming the best outcome, the budget passes, there's the day dawns tomorrow, and the underlying problems all still exist, the path forward to taming the nastiness and and creating a work environment that will allow someone to take a job and keep a job. What's that mechanism? Is this a staff problem? Is this an elected official problem? Who's looking at that? There's not a county administrator to take a look at it. I mean, who's who who's got their hand on that string to pull? Yeah, I, I'd like to discuss that. That's probably the first order, order of business. In fact, I would say that's one of the top requirements for the job when we hire a permanent county administrator. Uh, we need somebody who's going to come in, restore order, bring us out of chaos, and create a healthy work environment where we don't have one right now. We can't, we can't hire a finance director. We're not getting the right applicants when we put it out uh, to bid. Do we all that's know... Go ahead. Do we all know, I won't ask you to name names, obviously, but is it kind of a a, a well-known secret who, who the mean girl or the mean boy is, the, the, who the troublemaker is that, that needs to be taken care of? Well, I, I wouldn't put it in those terms, but if you read the news story from April of 2023, Commissioner Ass uh, was um, complaining about behavior from Commissioner Jackson. And uh, I can tell you that the... Social media accounts are clearly working on um, uh, on political campaigns, and they're attacking staff, and they're doing it in ways that are untoward. But you know what? I'm, I'm going to go a step further. There are stories you guys haven't even heard yet that are even nastier than what's being put out on um, in in regular media. When I was being considered to fill the vacancy during the same week that this social media uh, campaign was going out and calling for protest. I was getting death threats on me and my family that week. Now, I didn't get any death threats beforehand, and I haven't gotten any death threats since, but I got plenty that week. Now, if you think that's a coincidence, fine. I got a bridge to sell you. Death I don't threats? Think that's a coincidence. And I think this type of extreme political behavior is outrageous and has no place in public discourse. What were the stakes? I mean, what, death threats. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What was, what was at stake of such greatness that it went to this level? I don't know. I don't know. I think filling a county uh, commission vacancy is required by law. Um, I don't understand uh, why. Uh, th that I want to make clear, nobody said, to me, well, this is about the county commission, but I also don't think it's a coincidence that it happened the same week that the protests were called for and took place. It never happened before, and it's never happened since. But I, I don't know. I, I just think this is toxic. It's poisonous. It needs to be pulled back, and um, let's just all agree to disagree agreeably. Can't we get back to the time where we might have a policy disagreement, but we treat each other with respect? We don't leak personal information uh, to social media to slam people to attack people's families you know this blogger 
he posted pictures of my kids online. Like, who does that? Un- and, and who uncalled associates for. with these people? Uncalled. For. It's uh, it's dirty politics. Pasha, this is uh, symptomatic of the Republican Party now, which has become uh, known as much for its dysfunction uh, as anything else now, Pasha. And especially in West Virginia, where it's a supermajority, that even magnifies the dysfunctionality of the entire party right now. How do you see a way out of this for Republicans, registered Republicans around the state are, are uh, numerous. So how do you get out of this and, and back to uh, that line that, that used to be the Republicans were conservat- for conservatism and small government and not for terrorizing each other's members? I thought about that question a lot. Um, it's a very important question, and it's something that I have to face as a Republican because this is a problem in our party. Now, it's also a problem with the Democratic Party. Let's not give them a pass, but I'm a member of the Republican Party, and I'm focused on that right now. Uh, How do we take care of that? Here's what's happening. If we can just, for a second, pause on the moral questions of what's right and what's wrong and just engage in a political analysis. What's happening is now that we've become a one-party state, there's a part – there's a, a, a battle within the Republican Party on who will be defined as so-called establishment and who will be uh, defined as the rebel. And there's a competition going on for who wants to, who, who can claim the mantle as the rebel. And, of course, the self-described true conservative while the establishment is a sellout, right? That's the way they want to pitch it. Now, when, it, while you're in a competition to claim that mantle, you have to push the envelope further and further and further and further. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing competition among various groups. Who is going to say, I'm the rebel here, I'm fighting against the Republican Party while running in the Republican primary? So that's my political analysis. And, of course, that, that I'm not even commenting on what's right and what's wrong. Obviously, I think the tactics that I described earlier are wrong and have no place in public discourse. You asked the question, how do we solve it? Well, it's going to take some courage by candidates. And I'm not seeing enough of it right now. I'd like to see more condemnation of this type of behavior. And I'd like to see it. I, I will tell you that me and my family, we're looking at that very closely uh, before we vote in primary season. And I hope the voters are as well. Uh, who's going to stand up and say, we don't we don't allow that in our public discourse and we don't stand for that in the Republican Party. The Republican Party was founded in a moral movement. The abolitionist movement started by John Brown in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, and founded by Abraham Lincoln, the leader of our party. What a shame it would be if we were to let that dissipate, fade away over time, and we're to, we were to become crass and uh, craven and engage in uh, these type of tactics that are untoward, to say the least. I was having interviewed you while you were running for the House of Delegates in the seat ultimately won by Bill Ridenauer. I was very curious when your name came up as someone who was being considered on the Jefferson County Commission and the objection from some was that you weren't conservative enough. And I thought, after remembering my interviews with you, that was never one of the things that came to mind was that Pasha Majdi was not conservative enough. Well, it's funny. Uh, the folks that uh, uh, that are claiming others are not conservative enough, and they use the term rhino, if you haven't heard that before, Republican in name only, right? The, the, the folks who are uh, tossing that term around are the same folks who are putting into question your property rights, who are mishandling your tax dollars and who are being prosecuted for misconduct. So you tell me what's concerned. Hey, I have a question I wanted some clarification on that arrived via text. In regards to the death threats that you received, were the death threats anonymous or were they from the person who was doing the blogging? No, 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 not from the blogger, no. It happened at the same time, and my contention is that it's not a coincidence. It never happened before. It never happened since. And um, I got... Um, uh, death threats to me and uh, my children, and I got pictures of mutilated bodies. Um, of course, I reported it to the authorities. I worked uh, with the appropriate local authorities who called in FBI resources to look into it, and they couldn't connect it to a person. I mean, I've got the video on my phone, um, and I've shown it to the appropriate local authorities, but we couldn't uh, we couldn't connect it. So it's, it's using technology that's, um, I think, it's, I'm not an expert, but I think it's known as the dark web, mm-hmm. where you can um, 
communicate but not be traced. Uh, don't know how that works, but um, I'm fortunate I was on the wrong end of it. One final quick question from John. No, actually, it's not a question. It's a statement. This is the madness of the current political environment. It's the nationalization of everything. We're talking about Jefferson County, West Virginia. This is this is not the United States versus, you know, the 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 evil bad guys of the world. This is about a, a small community in a relatively small state trying to do the good for its citizens. It's a it's a small community and for it to get blown out to this degree, to this level of dysfunction and this level of political intrigue is just it, it blows my mind as as a thriller writer i mean it, it's it, it's great fodder for things that no one would believe uh people just need to tone this stuff down uh, uh gosh i'm just i'm i'm shocked that you had to go through this uh, it it just it blows my mind pasha thanks so much for your time this morning sir we'll get through it uh, i'm not intimidated we'll pass the budget on time follow the law and pa- uh, proceed with a conservative budgeting process moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Pasha.